This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Hey there, it's Brian Sebastian. Movie reviews and more worldwide TV network. Women on TV, iTube 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, and streaming live on K4TH Radio, K4HD Radio, Talk 4 Media TV Radio Podcasting, and all of the other platforms around the world Pandora, Spotify. Um, I got, what am I saying? Five minutes to get it. It's interesting. I'm kind of frazzled right now because I hear static in my ears, but I'm looking at everybody else and I think it's just me, but hey, welcome to the world of technology. So who's to say? And so here's the thing. I've been waiting for this show for months and months and months. Why? I'm not going to tell you why, but the thing, yeah, I am going to tell you because Sean Edwards is here. Dr. Russell Kennedy is here. Christina Morales is back everywhere. And, and, and one of the things I wanted to talk about was there's so much stuff going on in the world it's it's amazing what's happening these days. So here's the reason why I couldn't wait to have Sean on. Not only is he an award-winning journalist, Fox 4, Kansas City, Missouri, he is one of the best film critics out there. Talking, he speaks his mind. He doesn't really care what you may think sometimes, but you know what? There's a reason why he is one of the best out there. And this guy's interviewed everybody. So award-winning journalist, TV writer, producer, all the other things out there, African-American film critics, Critics' Choice, all of these things. And he's got some news coming up December 6th, the one and only Sean Edwards. Sean, I'm glad to get you here finally on our live movie reviews and more show. And no, man, it's good to be it's, it's, it's good to be here. Thanks for the invite, man. I really, I really, I, I appreciate it. Hey, and we've been talking about it for a long time. And a newfound friend. I like this guy. I found him in Clubhouse. For anybody who's on Clubhouse, Tosh was on Movie Reviews and More Clubhouse today. I've been talking about him for a while. I went into his room. I was just curious about anxiety, depression for all my friends who have it. He had 223 people in there. I'm like, what's he talking? Is everybody depressed? The answer is yes. Everybody's going through all kinds of anxiety, everything that you could imagine. Not only is he an award winner, he's got a book, Anxiety. I think it's 2020. Amazon bestseller. And again, I say all of this off the top of my head. I never use notes. It's all about energy. So Dr. Russell Kennedy, it's good to see you. Talk about what you have coming up real quick. Yeah, it's great to see you too, Brian. Um, Yeah, I'm an anxiety expert. I go on Clubhouse. I just produced a book called Anxiety Rx. It's out on audiobook and in print. And it's really going to change the way that anxiety is understood and treated. That's basically my, my mission in life is to show people how they don't have to suffer with anxiety like I did for 30 years. And back, back, she came back because I wanted to. She, she, <laughs> she found me on LinkedIn, Sean, which is interesting. And you know, we don't necessarily just have filmmakers and kind of put them on the air right away. We, we want to see what they have first, but I went the other way around. The fact that she reached out and I was like, oh, okay. She reached out. I got We got to help independent filmmakers because they're just, having a rush two years. And it was one of those things uh, that, Christina, tell us where you're coming from and how we got to know each other because I love Ride Plus One. Talk about that, go ahead. Hey, I'm so glad that you loved it. Um, you know, I was so amazed because I was just trying to reach out and get the word out about it because we have distribution, but nobody really knows that it's out there. 
So we've gotten really good reviews on um, Amazon Prime and such. And so I was like, oh, I need I need a critic to actually look at this. So I saw you, uh, uh, I guess it was on LinkedIn, and you right away got back to me, like, within an hour and a half and you're like, I liked it. I think you should come on my show. So I, I feel so blessed about that. And uh, yeah, bride plus one has been like a three year now labor of love. Um, and it's, it's something that I'm really proud of. Um, I don't know if, um, if Sean, if you've seen it or not, um, but I'm really curious to know and, and to know uh, what your critical thinking would be about it. No, I, I have not seen it, but I'm jealous because Brian's seen it and I haven't. So you gotta, you gotta zap me a copy to watch it tonight. I don't, I don't have any plans after this show tonight. I, will, I would love yeah. to watch it and give you immediate feedback tomorrow. I'm like, why haven't I got it? I, I, need, I, I need your movie in my life right now. Oh, yay. I love it. I love it. On its way to you. All right, so. there you go. No. Yeah. Thank so you. And the other Thank thing you. is we had to have Cyber Chuck on because uh, people were saying, I'm trying to get all these women. Where are the men? Well, we do have guys. It's just a matter <laughs> of they come into the studio more. We're in studio because we never stopped doing anything. So Cyber Chuck is here. Tasha from Miami is here. I think Terry just chimed in. And she just came up from the doctor. And you know, I like to talk about with Roxy to our engineer. So we can do all of this with everybody on here. So Russell, I got to start with you first. Dr. Russell yeah. Kennedy's talk about this. Let's talk about your book. Let's talk about what everybody's gone through the last two years. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, all anxiety is separation anxiety. And I heard that from Dr. Gordon Neufeld, who's a developmental psychologist uh, in Vancouver. And it really resonated with me. All anxiety is separation from other people, but it's mostly separation from yourself. And if, if you can't connect with yourself, you're going to be a sitting duck for anxiety. And we live in a society that basically just does its level best to separate us from ourselves. You know, we're always looking for the next thing. I've also got a degree in neuroscience. So I, I look at, you know, brain development, brain chemistry, how human beings basically want to want more than they like to want one when they have something they devalue it so just a little example of that a child on december the 15th gets a bigger dopamine hit in their brain from looking at their presence under the tree anticipating what it's going to be like to open those presents than actually the child gets when he's actually opening those presents on christmas day so we are we are a species that loves to want and we sort of devalue what we already have. And I think we miss, we miss a lot of the point. And, and that creates a tremendous amount of anxiety and separation from ourselves, within ourselves, and to other people. So, Sean, check this out. You know how we would look forward to the, seeing these bigger movies coming out? And we would get excited. And then we get there like, what, wait a minute. How do I get three hours back of my time? You know, it's that kind of <laughs> excitement to me, I think. But also, so here's the thing that Russell didn't say, Dr. Russell Kennedy didn't say, is that he's actually a comedian too. And he's actually performed, put, put this out, you know, at Yucks there with, guess what, Sean? Robin Williams and a few other other of our friends that we've interviewed throughout the years. Sean, talk about this side of this because I don't, I haven't found anybody else and I've been looking who has your qualifications, the stuff that you've been through, how you grew up, but also the community aspect of things. Talk about that. Well, like, like, like Dr. Kennedy just mentioned, um, <clears throat> since the pandemic's been going on, that whole community aspect of everything we do in life is gone. And if you are a fan of movies, if you're a lover of cinema, if you like film, the thing that makes that experience so special is the communal environment. And that's basically been missing from that experience the past 18 months. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, are, are, are movies coming back? Are movies back? Will people go back to the movie theater, you know, or multiplex is dead? And yeah, that all took a big hit during the pandemic. And I think what a lot of people realize is that we've had more access to content than ever before, but it just doesn't feel the same because we can't experience any of it in a communal environment. So not watching movies in a communal environment, I think has really been a detriment to the industry because movies are designed to watch with someone to your left and someone to your right and with your family, with friends, with strangers. So you experience the same thing at the same time. And, and that's been missing. And I, I think that's led to a, a, a huge chunk of why people are depressed. Remember, movies are 
are a form of escapism. And people would go to the movies to, you know, when they were happy, when they were sad, the, you know, it, it was a family event, a dating Audi, you know, it's and all that's been missing since the pandemic. So the industry's taken a big hit and I'm not quite sure what the future's like. A lot of people have gotten used to streaming. It's not as satisfying, but that theatrical experience has definitely taken a hit. And I think we're all the worse for it. Yeah, so I jump in there quickly too, just just to say the comedy clubs are exactly the same. Yes, you know it depends on you know the best comedy clubs have low roofs and people packed tightly together because comedy that laughter that response goes through our nervous systems and it relaxes all of us. And now we have comedy shows and and basically people are like eight feet apart and it's just it's just not the same and we don't get that same level of connection. And I think from a neuroscience point of view, that makes sense because we don't have that that sort of feeling that we have, have this nervous system, uh, what is it, like a, accentuation or this, this, this grooving together, all our nervous systems kind of form together. And we don't get that when we're separated this like eight feet apart. Yeah, I agree. There, there, there's something about a when, when you're watching a horror movie and there's this simultaneous yeah. scream with 200 people all screaming at the same time, or if, 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 if you're on a date, you know, jumping into your date's lap because you're, you're scared to death, are a funny joke that lands and hearing 100, 200, 300, 400 people all laugh at the same time or watching a, you know, a sad movie and, and being around 100 people all tear it up at the same time and, you know, holding a stranger's hand because you can't believe what just happened. I mean, I think all that adds to our human psyche and it's, it's, it's what we need. It's what drives us as, as people is it would, you know, it, it helps us to cope well, you know, movies help us cope with other situations in life. And when that's missing, I think society is the worst for it. Hey, Chuck and Christina, I'm going to go for you in a minute. But Sean, give them a little bit more background of what you do, what you started and how you got in, because you got a fascinating background. And you've also done some films, Christina. He's done some films out there. Yeah. Talk about the films that you've won things for. Uh, well, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, I got into this because, uh, like most people, you do what your parents do. And so my mom was a lover of movies. Uh, when I was a kid, we, you know, we went to the movies every weekend. I was fascinated by what I saw. And, you know, I just turned to her one day and said, wow, I, I really love movies. How do people make movies? And my mom was a teacher. So any kid who has a parent as a teacher knows she was not going to give me the answer, but instead took me to the library where I went and checked out a bunch of books on how you make movies and started making movies myself, went to college, made movies, uh, went to the same college as Spike Lee, watched all his student films, thought he was like <laughs> the coolest dude on the planet, you know, made my own films, minored in journalism, because you never know where your career path will take you. So, I mean, I started off as a journalism. Now I'm a filmmaker working at uh, Hidden Empire Film Group where we produce movies. And uh, I've just been entrenched in it. And, um, you know, also working with the Critics Choice Association, producing some award shows. So it's been a, it's been a fascinating track but it all started by, you know, with watching movies with my mother every weekend. Mm, it's wonderful. Yeah, Christina, that's, you that's can, you can relate to that from the that's woman's the point of view, right? What's that? I said you what can you relate mean? from this from the woman's point of view, right? Oh, just making it happen by yourself? Yeah, absolutely. For me, it was, um, you know, when I was little, just seeing those characters up on the screen and thinking that they were making those things happen and... At first I wanted to be an actress because I thought those people were making things happen. And then after I started acting, I realized that, you know, that I felt more like a prop. And so that's when I got into writing and directing because I was creating those things. You know, I, that that's that's my passion is creating. I, in, in Bride Plus One, I happen to be in front of the camera as well. But my true passion is the creation. And um, I have a question for Dr. Is it Dr. Russell? Is that how we yeah, address you, it? Yeah, most people call me Dr. Russ. So that's, that would be Russ. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about this because this is something that I've thought of that, you know, we don't have the movie theaters as much right now. And um, from a neurological standpoint, when you're looking up on the screen, um, do you access more of your subconscious uh, brain when you when you have when your eyes are rolled up? I've, I've heard something about that, and I'm I'm really curious because the way I've thought about it is, if that's true, then I as a filmmaker have a real responsibility to make sure that I'm 
putting positive things in there sure. for people's <laughs> psyche. Yeah, well, we have two types of vision as human beings, right? We have narrow angle vision and we have wide angle vision, like a panoramic vision. And typically, that's I think that's the the uh, the allure of the big screen is that we go into we have to go into panoramic mode with our vision because we have to use. So just in the room you're sitting in right now, guys, just see if you can look straight ahead and observe both of the walls on each side of you with your panoramic vision. And then look straight at, at me and the camera. And you can see the difference within the two visions. And there is something about that panoramic vision that is really relaxing, which is why we like going to the beach and looking out over, you know, an expanse of water, because it does bring in that panoramic view. But it's very interesting you say, like, do you access more of your emotional, you know, the limbic brain, the emotional brain with panoramic vision? I think you probably do. I mean, I don't there's no studies on it, of course, but I would think that because 70% of your brain is devoted to your visual system, you know, if you get the widest possible view with the biggest possible, you know, things up on screen, it's more, uh -huh. it's going to affect you more emotionally. Like if you see yeah. a movie on your, on your phone, as opposed to watching it on the big screen, it's a totally different experience. Exactly. And then also like in meditation, rolling back your eyes, you know, gives you a, a more meditated state. So that's why I was thinking that it may help you to uh, access your subconscious mind more. But, you know, just, just it, quickly, there's a little there's a, a there's a, a test that some people believe actually helps with telling if someone's hypnotizable or not. The farther you can roll your eyes back in your head, the more likely you are to be hypnotizable. So that's just, there was a little quick aside I wanted to throw in there. So I don't know if it's true, but I, you know, I've heard that from a number of sources. So it's possible. Interesting. Well, I really well, wanted to roll. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tosh. Go ahead. No, I was like, I really want to try that right now, but I'm going to look crazy. <laughs> so I'm going to roll your eyes like this. I'm not doing anything. I'm not. Oh, now now I'm in the, in the, the full frame, I'm <laughs> but I, that's interesting. I mean, I probably am not a hypnotizer book. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> But it's amazing, though. It's amazing how often we go through our day with that narrow angle vision, especially as we get more detached from each other, especially as we get more stressed. And I tell people, I just did a little Instagram uh, reel about this, is to really try and use your panoramic vision as much as you can through the day, because that does tend to relax your nervous system, mm -hmm. because you're not in that sort of when there's a threat, we look right at something for threat. But when we're, when we're relaxed, we have this sort of more panoramic vision. So I get people to try and, and do that when they're doing a walk in nature. Just like really focus and look up because most people when we're stressed, we look straight down. So look up, chin up a little bit, and then use that panoramic vision because it really does help relax you. So Cyber Chuck, let's talk about this because yeah. you can relate to a lot of, I'm sure what the doctor is talking about because of where you came from and what you do. And then talk about when you went back to the movies because of how your day is. Yeah, Chuck. So I can relate to um, anxiety because anxiety was something that was debilitating me. And it put me in a really dark place and COVID and the lockdowns really took me into a dark place especially having the anxiety and I was coping with it through drugs and alcohol. And luckily I was able to come to California, have an awakening and push past using drugs and alcohol. And now I use meditation. So I, I truly understand the meditation and rolling the eyes. I slightly roll them back in and uh, focus right here in the middle. And that really helps me with my anxiety. And I'd love to learn more about your techniques with anxiety because every day I'm still dealing with that. And uh, in terms of the movies, I never really went to movies when there was a lot of people there because of my anxiety. I don't like people sitting behind me or in front of me. So going to the movies now with less people uh, really hasn't affected me that much. So, you know, That's Sean really and I, point. okay, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Russ. No, it's a really good point that, you know, a lot of people, the more we, we get separated from each other, the more likely we're going to continue to be separate. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, once this pandemic ends and it will end, they all, all the pandemics through history have ended, but how quickly we're going to rebound from this. And if there is going to be this sort of, you know, heart opening for a lot of us, because we have been so starved for human connection, even just walking in the mall and connecting to people. I wonder, and I hope there's going to be this rebound that people want to be together after we get kind of through this. You know, hey, Tom, talk, talk about you being locked down. Go ahead. Well, that was a, that was a, that was a rough one. Cause um, I ended up getting COVID and I had to, you know, 
uh, quarantine myself because I live with my grandma and my mom. And I've never been in that situation where I'm literally like, I felt like I was locked up. I, you know, I couldn't really, I couldn't leave the room. They would leave the food out by the door. And, you know, at first I didn't um, think that it was going to affect me so much. And I had, I had a lot of anxiety that I never knew that I had. I, it was the first time I ever dealt with anxiety and I thought I was having like, you know, like I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was like, oh my God, like, is it, is it COVID or is it me? Like, just like thinking that I'm like, that I can't breathe. So it was, it was a rough, it was a rough time. Those two weeks, um, Brian helped me a lot with, uh, T uh, telling me to watch like uh, meditation and do um, and look into like Buddhism, which helped me a lot to kind of clear my head and kind of just calm down and be like, you know, you're you're okay, you're gonna get out of this. Like you, you just need to like, you know, kind of occupy your mind. So that was that was a rough rough time for me. Hey Terry, I'm gonna go to you in a minute. So Sean, what happened was I was giving her homework of movies to watch because I wanted her to be inspired. So, and then, you know, Dr. Kendall, the other thing was, what, what happens to those movie critics when we walk in, we, we, we're excited to see a movie back in the day, only a couple of years ago, yeah. and we would just roll our eyes on, what am I seeing? What, what, what do you call that? Well, <laughs> there, there is this issue with dopamine, right? Like, the, I, I don't want people to tell me that the movie's going to be great. Because Me I build up this expectation, <laughs> and then what happens is you get this dope, you get this dopamine kind of uh, dis dysfunction where you believe something's going to be great, and even if something was good, you're likely to kind of view it really negatively because your dopamine works up and it and it anticipates this great movie, and then you you have this expectation that it's going to be great, and if it falls below that expectation, we get a dopamine drop. Which me and and then we look at and we look at things really negatively. So you know it's it's really trying to uh, understand that dopamine is really a chemical in our brains that is more for anticipation and motivation than it actually is for reward. So then I just so have Sean, to say that okay, the movie ahead, is terrible. Okay, there you I go. See, there, you go. there you go. My movie is terrible. It sucks. <laughs> well, we've all done awful. that. We've we've all thought something was going to be bad. And you go in there and it's it's sort of borderline good and so you think it's great and then and then you go in there thinking it's going to be a great great movie and you go well that was just not as good as i thought you know so so there's there's really like we are these these neurologically wired creatures that put in all our stories on top of it and you know i think movie makers are sensitive i think that artists are sensitive and they're much more likely to suffer from anxiety because of that sensitivity. And they're much more likely to feel pain when they don't have that connection to other people than, say, the general population, whoever they are. Terry, I'm coming to you in a minute. But Sean, so you and I were talking about this, going to the theaters. I mean, the business was relying and waiting for and saying people, everybody's coming back the month of October. You and I are disagreeing on that, aren't we? People aren't going back to the theater. I don't care what they say. I'm seeing empty spots, except for James Bond. Well, even what James Bond, had, even James Bond had empty spots. Um, no, we're not. <clears throat> well, here's the dirty little secret that the movie industry doesn't really talk about all that often: the the theatrical experience was in trouble before the pandemic. Um, if anybody's being honest, they will admit that there was a decline in movie going. Be you know before the pandemic hit, the pandemic just extubated everything it, it, you know it's just like oh wow yeah no no one's going but no people are slow to return um particularly um uh, older people which makes sense because you know the, the conditions just aren't right and you know they're more susceptible you know to the coronavirus um mothers aren't returning back with their kids because you know it's 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 hard enough to keep them in school because there have been massive outbreaks at school so you don't want to take a child to a movie theater and, you know, catch COVID night, you know, so a lot of parents are staying away. Plus there's so many options for them to watch stuff at home. And it's also more affordable. You know, if you have a family, two or three, four or five kids, you know, going to the movie theater now is what it used to cost to go to Disney world back in the day. It's really expensive. So, you know, it's a lot easier just to, you know, pay that seven ninety nine dollars to Netflix or Amazon prime or, you know, Disney plus and, punch up movies all day for them to watch. So yeah, mothers with kids aren't going back either. Um, you know, a lot of African-Americans and Hispanics aren't going back either, you know, for, for various reasons. So 
there, there's a lot of the demographic pie that, that are not going back to the movies and, you know, box office is down overall and, you know, excitement's down. A lot of movies have gotten pushed around. People can't keep up with the release dates and there's so many different platforms. Nobody knows what's showing where, you know, that's, you know, you used to could talk to a group of friends or coworkers or at events and say, you know, I saw such and such and everybody would be like, Oh, okay, I'm going to go watch that. And you knew exactly where to go see it. Before you even start talking about a movie or a TV series, you got to let people know where you watched it first so you can find it. Because there's just so many options that consumers are completely confused. Exactly. Terry, I know you had, you had a lot to say about anxiety and depression and things like that. Nonstop, it's good to see you here. You had a rough day. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't feeling that great earlier today, so I had a doctor's appointment, but I'm going to be okay. So that's why I have like, no makeup on and doing like this. But I just wanted to add something. Um, and I think Brian, you know, this, I mean, I, my degree is in psychology and I actually worked at the Meadows for five years in Wickenburg, Arizona with trauma and addiction and all that. So I'm very well, have a lot of knowledge in that area, dealing with uh, trauma, abuse, drug addiction and alcohol addiction. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of crazy because I think a lot, there was people out there already who are dealing with, with anxiety and depression. And then going into the pan pandemic, it just escalated it. Myself, I also wasn't a victim of abuse. My ex-husband almost killed me. That's a whole def def different show. So I have suffered for, from PDS, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I deal with that mostly by working out, going to the gym, uh, having the right diet. I, I do better than taking, you know, some of uh, than taking medication. Um, it just, it works better for me. Um but I noticed when the pandemic hit, my anxiety went up. As soon as everybody was walking around with a mask on, I couldn't see people's faces. And I don't know if that's from my post-traumatic stress disorder, just from the anxiety or other things that I've dealt with, then shutting the gym down. But still now, though, I mean, and I know we need to wear them, but the mask thing, not being able to see people's faces and the perception, I guess it's coming from a perception, um, has really like affected me. <laughs> so I just wanted to know what your opinion was, Dr. Gannity, on that. Um, if you have seen other people that have dealt with that kind of anxiety, just based on maybe not the human connection with the mask. Yeah. I mean, starting with mm -hmm. the mask, it is, it is one of those things like we are, mm -hmm. there, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a situation that happens in the brain called prosopagnosia, which basically means you can't mm -hmm. recognize faces. And those people have a really difficult time with stress. Because mm -hmm. even when we're younger, when we're babies, we're neurologically wired to look at our mother's face. Like that's what we're wired for. Mm -hmm. And that's what soothes us is being able to look at faces and connect with that. And the other thing on top of that mask thing is that, that we get reminded every time we see somebody with a mask that we're in this kind of pandemic. Mm -hmm. We're in this place that we have to be separate. So it, it sort of adds insult to injury in a lot of ways. So a lot of people look at that mask like it's it, it really is it's just another method of separation, which is basically mm -hmm. what happens, you know. And that's all anxiety. All anxiety is separation anxiety, and now we're experiencing that in, in such a deep, um, you know, physical way when we're hiding our faces from people all the time, and it it is a really difficult situation. And I have this this my personal feeling about anxiety is it's typically you know, childhood trauma that was unresolved, yeah. it gets stuffed down into our body. And then that's, and, and to, to heal that, to make it feel better, that's how addictions start. Because mm -hmm. basically addicts aren't doing it to get high. They're basically doing it to, to try and assuage the pain of, the, of, the of their childhood wounds, typically. So mm -hmm. my issue and what I wrote the book about is my own issue growing up with a schizophrenic and bipolar father and having all that alarm stuck in my body. And of course, what we're going to do is we're going to stay in our heads. We're going to ruminate. We're going to make up worries because that keeps us out of this pain that we've stuffed in our body. But until we actually go back into the body and allow ourselves to feel that pain and process it. We never actually heal from it. And we're always trying to use cognitive means like cognitive behavioral therapy. You're trying to fix uh, a, a, a feeling issue with a cognitive solution. And it just doesn't work. And that's why I wrote the book, because we have to feel it before we can heal it. we got to be able to go in, feel our own bodies, connect to our own bodies, and sort of get out of our heads. I think... I think um, Tash, were you saying earlier on, it was hard to, it's hard to get, you know, what, what do you do when you're anxious? And I just tell people, go into your body, like put your hand over your chest, try and 
and, and focus on sensation of just your own compassionate touch. And then focus on your breath. Like the more energy you can focus on sensation in your body, the less energy is left over to fuel those negative, like regurgitant thoughts that just keep going. So it's really, you know, my book is really about how I healed from 30 years of anxiety, taking every type of therapy, psychotherapy, CBT, all that kind of stuff that helped for a short term, but it didn't help. It didn't heal the problem. It helped me deal with it, but it didn't heal the problem until I went into my body and healed it from there. Yep. And it's another thing that we used to talk about at the Meadows is trauma bonds. People yeah. don't realize there's trauma from, from past relationships. There's trauma from your childhood. Trauma can come from everywhere. And then people get bonded that trauma and then they try to heal it. And they don't realize that they put themselves in that situation again, over and over and over again. I'm guilty of it. And I'm educated in this area. And sometimes I got to go back. Okay. I'm like, bonding the trauma that happened to me a while back and I'm, I'm putting myself in this situation and it's it's weird because sometimes you you know this stuff but you still do it but you have to take a step back does that make any sense and, oh you know, totally i mean yeah. we have the conscious mind that's aware and then we have the unconscious mind where all these programs are stored mm -hmm. you know so freud coined this phrase called the repetition compulsion which is basically what what was familiar to you in childhood you will unconsciously replicate in your adulthood. As an example, I had a patient, beautiful girl, um, attracted all sorts of men, but she would only pick abusive alcoholics for boyfriends. Her father was an abusive alcoholic. So basically what she was doing is unconsciously making her present day adult life very similar to what her childhood was. And we do this automatically. Human beings have this compulsion to, to make what happened to us as, as children secure because it's familiar. Mm -hmm. So we have this, this compulsion to repeat the familiar because we assume the familiar was secure when it was actually, in a lot of cases, it was nothing like security. It was actually the opposite of that. Or sometimes you're trying to fix the problem that you couldn't fix is not fixable. I find totally. myself doing that all the and, time. And that's, I think that I was saying that earlier on, like sometimes the most intense attraction attractions we have for other people are the people that really mirror those old wounds to us. And Absolutely. That would, which would be the same thing with my patient. It was the same thing. It would mirror her, her wounding with her father. So she would go into it again. And it's yeah, very seductive. Yeah. I think that that's the reason I married my ex-husband because I was trying to fix things in him from other issues that I couldn't fix, um, you know, and of course, you know, I got hurt in the process physically, but I mean, I know what the attraction was. And I know what it was there. So, I mean, half the battle is realizing that you have these issues and we're all human and we all have these issues. You know, we all, it, it's just what we come with. <laughs> so. and sometimes it's got to get that bad Terry before we change. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like sometimes we have to hit the wall because mm -hmm. I, I read a quote the other day it was like, nobody like nobody in their own in their own right mind goes into to learning what they have to learn like yep. voluntarily right yeah we all get we all get slammed in there because the other the other option is horrible yeah i have a i have a, a saying and i've always said that everybody at some point god slaps them across the room like slaps their ass and like wakes yeah. them up because everybody's got a lesson in this life to learn no matter who you are how much money yeah. you make doesn't matter. You have a lesson to learn. So that's kind of and where Bill I Burr type. says that too. Bill Burr says, you know, like every you're, everybody's mouthy until someone <laughs> smacks you in the face, right? Yeah, like that's exactly. kind of like the wake up call. So, yeah. so yeah, it's totally that it's mm -hmm. things have to get to a certain level of, of horribleness before we do anything about it. But that's just the human condition really. So Christine talks about, about this, Christina. Um, I, I was always curious about independent filmmakers and what they had to go through. You didn't know what they had to go through until you hear, heard the stories. And again, when it comes to Sean and I doing these things like this and the other film critics, we're, we're you know, we we want to give the voice out there. But like Sean says, there's so many outlets to have all these things on. And I don't think a lot of it when it comes to marketing now, you can you can get it all out there because there's so many outlets to get it and they get lost. Even I say now from the average person, where'd you see it? Uh, no one told me about it and I get really upset and pissed about that, you know? Right. That's why I have, you know, the bride plus one.com so that people can go there and they can see all the different platforms because that is honestly the most difficult part is, you know, separating yourself from all the other content that's there. And so in terms of the, the getting, being an independent filmmaker, I feel like I, in a way, made a mistake 
by going with, oh, I hope, I hope I'm not, I, I don't want to sound like I'm bad mouthing, but basically I went with a distributor that gave me a great deal, only 20% off the top and they wouldn't, they wouldn't take anything. Right. So like most distributors will take 30% uh, back and then like the first 30,000 or something like that. So I thought I got a great deal, you know, having the, the 20% and they weren't going to take anything off the top, but they also don't do any advertising. So I have this film mm -hmm. that I'm really proud of. That's all across the nation that anybody can see, but nobody knows about it. <laughs> so that's really, that's really challenging for me. Sean, your thoughts on that? What's that? Nope. No, he's Sean. asking me my thoughts on that. We gotta we we gotta change it. I mean, like you said, you reached out to Brian on LinkedIn. There's just go to LinkedIn, type in, you know, film critic, reach out, you know, shoot it to me, build a network, we'll talk. I can plug you in. You just gotta you gotta you gotta reach the people out there that can spread the word. And sometimes that happens, you know, behind the scenes underground, but it can be done. So yeah. I'll talk about the Critics Choice Awards. Uh, talk about the African film, uh, sure, African Americans sure. film critics. Well, no, I'm a I'm a member. I've been a member of the Critics Choice Association since the early 2000s, and now I'm a second term board member. And um, you know, we pride ourselves on being the largest film critics group in the world, 500 plus members. But you know, unlike the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, we're pretty diverse in terms of membership and programming. Um, this year, we'll be celebrating for the first time ever a celebration of Latina film on December the 9th, It'll be a virtual celebration. Then on December the 6th, we're doing our fourth annual celebration of black cinema, a really big event, actually doing it in person this year, hooray, pandemic hopefully over. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking forward to, you know, doing that celebration. Halle Berry is receiving the Lifetime Career Achievement Award. Uh, hard to believe it's been 20 years since she won the Oscar for Best Actress. So it's a, it'd be a 20 year celebration for her win for her performance in Monsters Ball. She's more than deserving of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Jennifer Hudson is getting the Best Actress Award. Uh, a lot, a lot, of, lot, of, lot of celebrities to be in the house. But like I said, we're committed to creating diverse programming. We have been, we weren't forced to do it. It's something we did on our own and we're, we're really excited about it. It's something that I created back in the day. And um, you know, I've been, I've been pushing the history and celebrating black film for a long time. I, I created my first documentary on the history of black film way back in 2007. This is way before people were even thinking about it, way before inclusion orders, way before George Floyd's death, way before any of that. So um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm happy to see that more and more people are, you know, recognizing different types of filmmakers from different ethnicities and genders and perspectives and points of view. And we're leading the charge as an organization. Wonderful. Yeah. Dr. Kennedy, talk about what comedy did for you. Why was that outlet good for you? And talked about who were some of the people. And, you know, we and unfortunately, a lot of comics are coming down with COVID, but also we've lost some great comics. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think comedy, you, I think you have to have a bit of a screw loose to start doing comedy in the first place, right? <laughs> like, I, I think it's true. I think that, that but your need, your, your need for acceptance and validation is so great that you will stand up in front of a bunch of strangers and pour your guts out and hope that they laugh. And it's, it's a painful process for sure. And I think it, it requires a certain psyche. I think there's a certain amount of masochism to go out in front of people like that and then want to do it again, like just keep doing it. And I was thinking about this in the shower. There's a few comics that I know that have, that didn't start out with a lot of talent, but are, are decent. Now they're, they're decent comics, but I've never seen a, a comic who didn't have a lot of talent right off the start do really well, like become a really, really good comic. And for me, what it did was it took me out of this world of this, because I would, be a, a doctor during the daytime in this left brain analytical, you know, saving lives, quote unquote, kind of thing. And then at night I could exercise my right brain and I could do, I could talk about whatever I wanted to, to a certain extent. I mean, as a physician, you're kind of looked at as an upstanding member of society. So it's not like you're out there swearing a lot or whatever, but, uh, but it was, it was something that really helped my right brain and, and, and play and play is so important. For, for just mental health in general. And we're kind of losing that. 
So I think for, for me, comedy was kind of play. It was ability to go out, you know, see something that, because here's the thing. I think comedy is, is we take things that don't make sense and we make them make sense. Or we take things that, that make sense and make them not make sense. And, and I think comedians, uh, by and large, had trauma when they were younger because when you get traumatized when you're younger, you have to look at the world in a very different perspective. If you get all your needs met as a child, you don't really need to go outside of that framework. But if you're suffering as a child, we're constantly going outside that framework. And I think we look at the world in a very different way. So it got, it was, it was an ability for me to start exercising my right brain, having some play and not being in that left brain life and death situation every day. Cyber Chuck, what are you thinking so far? I can see things going on in your head. Yeah. You know, I, I have and, a question. And, and, because... and, and talking about that, here's a man who literally spins on top of his head. <laughs> no, I, I had a question for Dr. Russ. Um, what are your thoughts on plant-based medicine? Because a lot of people have been turning to plant-based medicine to deal with traumas and anxiety. Yeah. And I know me personally, I have done everything. I've taken medications. I have a list that are just pages long. I've been in and out of rehabs and it wasn't until I had an experience on plant-based medicine that I stopped using alcohol and I stopped using uh, hard drugs right after. I never have went back to using any of that stuff again. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it, in the next five to 10 years, what you're gonna see in, in psychiatry and psychology is a lot more somatic body-based therapy and you're gonna see a lot more psychedelics. And we're seeing it now. We're seeing MDMA assisted therapy, ayahuasca assisted therapy, um, uh, ketamine assisted therapy, because what it does is it gets us outside of that protective ego that part of us that won't let us go into our trauma because it's just too painful. And unless you go into that trauma, we never actually change it. So we can change our thoughts around it, but that doesn't really change the trauma. So what I find is that psychedelics are one of the things that kind of divorce you from your ego. It kind of puts your ego aside and you become kind of one with everything. You become kind of your conscious and your unconscious don't have that boundary so much anymore. And you can kind of experience your traumas in a way that you can see them differently. Now, that said, I am not a big fan of just sort of, hey, I've got anxiety, depression, OCD, eating disorders. I should try a psychedelic because yeah. I think it can actually do more harm than good. So it has to be kind of in a, in a, in a place where people feel safe, where people are trained. Um, it's not one of these things where like, hey, Bill, let's go and do LSD and see if I can solve my eating disorder. You know, like that's not the issue. But I think that what it does do, what the psychedelics do do, is they get outside of that protective ego that won't let you go into your trauma. Because your ego, when you're in your quote unquote right mind, your ego will not let you get into that trauma. And that's why I think psych, uh, somatic therapy is really helpful because that some, sometimes helps you get around that kind of ego block. But the psychedelics, I think, are very effective in that. But what I always tell people when they ask me, and I get asked this a lot, is is should I do psychedelics? And I said, do six months of somatic experiencing therapy first. Do six months of somatic therapy first, because that'll prime your body for it, for one. And it'll also give you a different perspective on things. And maybe you won't have to do the psychedelics after that. So I think they're very, very helpful, but I think they really have to be used in a very controlled, specific way, rather than just kind of, uh, I've got this uh, addiction, I need to take ayahuasca to get rid of it. So Tosh, talk about what you have coming up. And what well, you're on. there's been a lot going on, but I'm going to do it super quick since we have very little time left. So um, I'm Natasha. I'm a Latin, uh, urban Latin singer. Uh, recently started about a year and a half ago. And the greatest thing that happened and, to me. And you just found out that you're probably related to Christina. Yeah. <laughs> we, we actually might be like third cousins. <laughs> Because <laughs> we're both from Venezuela and we're both, we lo both look super cute and curly hair and all that stuff. But um, so I have such important news. Um, this past Sunday, I got my first TV interview that aired about my music video, um, about my music and everything. And going back to what Christina was saying, like, I'm a... Um, I'm an artist that does everything. I don't have a team. You know, I do social media. I do advertising. I do everything. So it is challenging when you don't have 
a group of people helping you get your stuff out there. And I just want to tell you, Christina, that just continue being persistent because I've been super persistent this whole past week and I landed myself a TV interview with Mega TV, which is a huge Spanish channel station in Florida, Puerto Rico. And I was like, I was so proud and it, everything just starts rolling off that, you know, once you start seeing that all of your hard work and your dedication to your passion, like people will start seeing that and will want to, you know, talk to you about it and share that same excitement. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. I hope you'll be in my next movie. We, we oh my god! Gotta, yeah, we gotta we gotta collaborate. We're gonna <laughs> chat. We're gonna chat after this because I really I really want to get to uh, know you a lot more since we might be related as well. Yeah. yeah. So so Sean and Dr. Kennedy about this is that uh, the reason one of the reasons why I'm really happy with Tosh because she came from me from one of my friends uh, just to do an interview and I said I need someone to upload my shows. I I, I don't have time to do all this stuff. So Sean. Dr. Kennedy, she sees everything that we're doing through the back end. Once she saw all the numbers going up, she started saying her head started rolling, huh, Tosh? And she started seeing what was going on because we only go by views. We don't go by followers. You can always unfollow someone. We don't go by likes. You can always unlike something. And we definitely don't go by subscribers because you can always unsubscribe. What do I always say, Tosh? You can't unview or view, right? Mm -hmm. That's why you're doing well. And I couldn't be happier for because I want everybody who comes on the show, our job is to make you better. Hopefully, you know, leave you with those, you know, those experiences and that you meet people like, you know, your future sister right there, you know, you're related to now. <laughs> All right, Christina, go ahead. What do you want? What do you want to hear about? <laughs> okay, what do, you, what do you got coming up between now and the end of the year and social media links? Uh, so, so social media, we've got Red Plus One is where you can see all of the different uh, platforms. And then Dancing Star Productions is my produ production company. And so you can see what we have in development there. And then we have Dancing Star Creative Academy. So if you want to learn how to make your own films, uh, you can do that with us. Oh, and Christina Morales, I'm in way .com too. Yeah, if you want to know about all the other stuff that I do. I'm in my in my spare time. Okay. Cyber Chuck, go ahead. Uh, from here into the now or the end of the year, we're just uh we're just pushing the Team Cyber Yoga movement, uh, just daily, just motivating and inspiring. And we're trying to grow the team and grow people that like the movement and create a safe place for people to come and talk. So we're probably moving over to Clubhouse to have chats and talks where people can come in and just you know, have a safe place to come and to share whatever's going on with them and to support one another because we feel that community is important. And through everything that's been going on, our little community that we've created has been so important and we inspire and motivate each other daily. And you can find me at CyberChuck 2.0 and at Team Cyber Yoga on all the platforms. And he literally does a great photo of him standing on top of his head. Him and our, you know, his brother and our friend Lamont Good. That's why I like them because they 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 do some weird stuff, some wild stuff. Dr. Kennedy, go for it. What do you got coming up between now and the year? Talk about your clubhouse. Uh, clubhouse every Sunday, uh, twelve noon Pacific time. I take all comers, all questions about anxiety. I try and give people the information that they need as opposed to the information that's kind of out there in traditional medicine and psychiatry, which I don't believe works that well. My book is Anxiety Rx. It's available on audiobook. I narrated it. I'm a stand-up comedian as well as a, as a, a doctor, so I like uh, putting some entertainment in the book as well. And it's informative, and it's, it's going to change the way that anxiety is understood and treated. It's not, it's not just another anxiety book. It's, it's endorsed by Dr. Nicole LaPera, who has 4 million followers on Instagram. And it's just a great book. It's just, it gives you a different framework and a different way to heal than, than you've ever seen. Because I had 30 years of anxiety. I wasn't healing with traditional medicine and I needed something different. So I had to heal myself. Thanks, Sean. And best-selling Amazon author. Thanks, everybody. Stop. Go for it. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to say something just to everybody out there, because I've been having to fight with personal demons the last six months and it's okay. And um, maybe I am a little bit behind on stuff because of that, but I'm pushing forward. So sometimes you need to maybe take a step back and heal yourself. It's okay. Um, just it, And it's okay to feel pain and it's okay to hurt. Um, we're all human. But looking forward, <laughs> I'm uh, working on artwork right now. I'm starting to draw 
Um, I'm working on some NFTs. Um, I'm going to be, I'm in a music video um, for Wiki Kidstar, which is being, that's coming out in the beginning of the year. Um, I'm getting, I'm going to try to start competing again. Uh, I've been with Brian over six years uh, doing enter entertainment hosting. So I'm glad that this COVID thing is hopefully almost past us. And uh, Brian knows I'm dedicated. I am feeling like crap today. I'm not, not, not feeling very well, but I'm here. <laughs> so That's okay. You made more. it. And I have to always yeah, say that I'm she has that. over 3 million views and counting still just by yeah. being on our shows. But my so, message was is that we're all human. We all go through times of, that are harder and it's okay. You know, just get up tomorrow and try to be a better person and learn from it. That's my message for today for anybody who's feeling down. Because I know sometimes people watch these shows and see all, all these things that are people do are doing and then they feel insecure about themselves. But like we all go through this. And I just think it's really important to stress that even when we're successful, there's times that we feel pain. And I and and I just I mean that with all my heart. Just don't ever give up. And my social media is Terry Marie uh, official. I'm sorry, that's my um, website. And then nonstop Terry Marie on all other platforms. So, Sean, you get the last word. Go for it. Just want to say thanks for having me on the show. Uh, Critics' Choice on all platforms. That's Critics' Choice on all platforms. Hope everyone watches the big show on January 9th. Celebration of Black Cinema, December the 6th. Celebration of Latina Cinema, December the 9th. Uh, keep watching movies. Let's talk about them. It's always fun. And I want to thank everybody for coming on for Talk for Media, K4HD, Radio, iHeart, Pandora, Spotify, all the platforms around the world. And I have to say this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody for coming on because I have to always say this. Have a good night tonight, a better day tomorrow. If you see someone without a smile, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. I'm Brian Sebastian. This is Movie Reviews and More, and we will see you next week.